Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this podcast, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen at S2 Breakthrough and talk about how we use data to create systems and training approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. This is the final episode of series three. Uh, And for those of you who are just joining, series three has been all about velocity and specifically the velocity culture that we've created in softball pitching. So in today's episode, we have a special guest. We have Kyle Lindley from Driveline Baseball. Uh, Kyle, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. We're really glad you're here. Um, So just a little backstory. The reason we wanted to have Kyle on today, uh, Kyle, you obviously are going to talk to us a lot about Pulse, the product that you that you work with, uh, you know, pretty hands on every day at Driveline, uh, which is going to be, you know, my, a tech piece, which you're obviously going to talk to us about a piece of technology that's going to help us measure workload, uh, arm health, give us really put some things in context regarding, uh, you know, how your pitchers are throwing, what types of data they need to be looking at, how they're modifying programs. And I thought that this would be such a great way to end this, this series because we've been talking about, you know, the, the things that we do in the softball culture that uh, in my mind really are just like traditions and training methods that are stuck in the past. So no doubt about it, our game is growing, popularity is growing as it should, as it deserves, but we really need to start advancing how we look at data, how we use data to maximize what pitchers can do. Um, And so I think this discussion today is just going to be a great way for us to see, like, we have to keep moving forward in the softball world. And right now, the baseball world is blowing us out of the water. You've just sort of been collecting data for so much longer. The idea of putting, you know, uh, like a tech a sensor on somebody's arm to measure workload is something that's a little futuristic for us right now, but we need to start having those conversations to see what we're moving into. So that's what I really thought the purpose of this conversation could be. It's like, we've got to look to the future to start driving what we're doing in a better direction. So again, thank you for joining today. Super excited about this, this conversation. Um, Let's just start with, can you tell our listeners like what I know I kind of gave like a you know, five bullet point summary there, but what is Pulse? How do you use it? What does it measure? Let's just kind of start with some of those, those small details. Yeah, for sure. Also just want to start with the baseball industry was, was right there a few, a few years ago, like even drivelines training. We like, you know, Kyle Bode started with weighted balls. He's realized that they helped train velocity. And the first few years of that program, some of the athletes that went through it, they called it tissue testing because it was just like, <laughs> it was so much volume, so much work on and that. And it's, it's been improved since then, but um, we were right there as well. Um, Pulse is just, uh, I actually brought a sensor here with me. Um, it's a little, it's a little chip here. Uh, people like to call it that goes into a strap and then the strap goes on your arm and you wear it for all of your throws. You can either get live feedback or you can just, um, wear it without it, without it connected to your phone, it just automatically detects throws and then, um, calculates some metrics for each one of those. So when you sync the data to your phone, it'll give you total throw count that it measured. It'll give you ar- uh, elbow torque. It'll give you arm speed and, uh, arm slot as well. And then basically takes those uh, metrics and calculates a workload metric for each throw based on the intensity, which is, uh, based on the torque value. And then for that day, it'll give you an accumulated workload, one day workload, and then that can be extrapolated out over the last nine days and the last 28 days to give you an idea of what's your chronic workload, which is what you've been kind of, we use it as like a throwing fitness measure. What was your body used to based on how much you've been throwing and then acute workload, how much have you been recently throwing? And then we can compare those to be like, okay, you're throwing too much like you're throwing more than your body's used to in the last week. Maybe we need to ramp it back down. We call that the uh, chronic workload ratio. I'll probably refer to it later as ACR, but Mm -hmm. um, 
that's the whole idea behind it. If you're throwing way more in the last seven days than you are in the last like month or so, then maybe you're on ramp. If you're even if you're in an on ramping phase and you're trying to increase how much you're throwing, uh, maybe it's going too fast, uh, for example. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and it's kind of being used as a tool, one, by athletes alone, just to kind of get some insights on their training and also by uh, coaches and organizations to kind of track their players programs a little bit better, have some measured feedback for workload uh, and intensity and be able to manage more throwing programs uh, kind of from the same, from the same seat without working one-on-one with everybody. Yeah, it's great. So, okay. So we know from the softball community, like we have this myth that, you know, softball, because the underhand motion and the overhand throwing motion, they are not apples to apples. As we know, we kind of got this, like, this myth, this bad rap that it's like, okay, the softball pitching motion is natural. You could mm-hmm. do it forever and ever and ever mm-hmm. high intensity, insane volume, 365 days a year. And, and honestly, yeah. like, I mean, the amount that pitchers throw all year long at super high volume, super high intensity is like jaw dropping. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's our culture. We think that's fine. And so uh, what we have really started to see as we're collecting more and more data, particularly over the last like three or so years here at S2, is like our pitchers just generally across the nation, they're just chronically fatigued. And, mm-hmm. and obviously that explains why, but we know that in baseball, the bare minimum for a long time, things like pitch counts, have been in your culture, right? And so the way I see it and kind of jump in and correct me wrong, but pitch pitch counts is like one size fits all blanket over like, hey, we know this is too much stress on the arm. So I just want to kind of take a step back. Like we're not even recognizing it in softball that yes, we might not have the same like joint forces at the elbow, but we have a lot of stress on the arm and the motion. And so it's not like- In the the body, body. absolutely, absolutely. And so it's like, okay, so- we're not even at that point yet of like, we don't even say you got a cap at something, but for you guys in baseball culture, that's existed for a long time. Mm. Um, and so now what seems to me is like what pulse is, is like next level. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, this is not a blanket one size fits all. You get to 60 pitches and every guy out there, every guy on the training floor has to stop. It's more of like, you have to really understand the highly individualized nature of who you are, what your arm health is about, what your goals are, what time of year it is for you. Um, And it gives an opportunity to really like, again, look at data that's about you and only you. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so to me, like pulse bus pitch counts totally out of the water. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's just so many things that are outside that pitch counts don't measure, right? Even on game day. It pitch counts are might be like half of the throws that you actually make. You got the pre-inning uh, pitches that you throw on the mound when you uh, get out there. You have your warm-up throws before the game, the catch play and the long toss. And a lot of people are throwing uh, plow care balls now. So, and you're not a lot of pitch counts don't measure that. So even on game day alone, you're missing a lot of the, all those, those throws aren't free. They still like count towards uh, taking away from your, your fitness that day. Um, they might be preparing you for later on if they're warmups, but um, they do count. And then that's not even to mention yesterday's throwing and the day before is throwing and um, all the throwing that you've done in the last little bit to, to get ready. So pitch counts. I mean, if somebody makes 400 throws, um, 400 throws is, I think, a, a reasonable count for a, a, a weekly throw count for a normal like, you know, high school, college pro athlete. And if you if they might throw even if they throw 80 to hundred pitches in the game, that's less than a quarter of uh, their total throws. And you're just not measuring all the other 75%. So um, pitch count, I think it's a good, it's obviously a good idea. It came from good intent, but it's just, it's missing the bigger picture. Um, and, and I think needs, needs to, the other, the other throws need to be counted and, and measured as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I was kind of that went into that question thinking about how it was just too general. And, mm-hmm. and I think you're uh, just kind of bringing to light, like there's so many gaps, there's so many holes. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that all the time, just watching college softball game, they're like, this pitcher's on pitch 125. I'm like, yeah, in the game. But in her warm up, she probably threw another 125. I mean, right. seriously, sometimes it's like, it's crazy. So um, I know 
you know, personally, when we're programming, we do a lot with weighted balls, uh, both overload and underload, obviously, depending on the pitcher, uh, we are constantly changing intensity. Um, when you know, the way in which we really approach like pitch development as a low intensity concept, primarily until we build it back, um, we, we do a lot at various intensities and it's like, not really, I, I just kind of wrote something about it on Twitter, maybe a week or two ago. Um, it's not really a concept that people are even familiar with in softball. Like they don't, everything is like max, 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 <laughs> more is more is yeah. more. And I think even like a lot of our remote athletes that I work with, um, sort of the national stage, they'll say to me, like, this doesn't seem like enough pitches, like that, what I'm going to be mm-hmm. doing. Like I, they're so used to throwing so much. So because even though we have identified like pitch counts, there's been a whole, there's so many holes in that story. But because that has at least existed for a long time in the baseball culture, what is what can you kind of describe as the relationship or just generally in the baseball culture? How do people really think of workload? Would you say like a lot of guys uh, like let's talk about just basic like high school athletes, high school, college athletes, they typically underthrow, they overthrow. Like what is how do people even think about workload? And and, uh, you know, I guess kind of two parts of this. How does workload like link to something like arm health, which I mm-hmm. assume pitch counts helps them understand like these are connected. You want to stay healthy. You've got to make sure you're not overthrowing. Mm-hmm. And then what happens, like how do people start to think about workload in baseball when velocity is their target and they're actively trying to chase below? I think there's a lot of aspects there that could be talked about, but the mm-hmm. first, I think, Workload and arm health, like you mentioned before, because pitch counts, in-game pitch counts off the mound, two hitters have been quantified for so often or so long. Um, Oftentimes, athletes equate that to arm health, that alone. But really, it's how you prepare for those games or pitches in the game that are going to affect how those affect how those pitches affect your arm health. So and it's going to be the same for velocity. Right. If you like prepare better. Um, for those pitch counts, those pitch counts are going to be better bullets. You're going to be able to make sure you're physically ready for those for those uh, pitches. So I think a lot of it's very idealistic, and a lot of people have programs that work, and they say, like, if they deviate from those, if they throw more than what they're used to, more than what their coach says, then, like, they realize that maybe workload's a little bit too much. But within, like, inside of those, those um, I don't know, programs, when things change, or um, I don't know if they're if they like miss a day or whatever. There's not a whole lot of flexibility in the way they think about it. It's just like this program works. This is how I should do it. So if I don't throw like say I throw 50 pitches in the game or something, um, that may not get like instead of 100 pitches, that might not get uh, like incorporated into any changes in their programming. So I think. There is an understanding with pitch counts and that, you know, being related to arm health and being related to overall workload, but it's just very structured, not very dynamic to actual situations, whether you didn't sleep very good the night before or two nights ago, or you threw a lot in the field three days ago or whatever. So we're not super sensitive to those yet. And I think that's something that polls is, is kind of helping, um, but yeah, I think I think in ge- in general the in-game pitch counts is like people understand that more means you might need to take another day or, or two off. Um, as far as velocity, that's it's hard for me to say in season. I don't have a ton of experience, but workload and velocity doesn't seem to be super connected in most people's heads intuitively. So like if their velocity was down on game day, like maybe their first, maybe their mind goes to mechanics. You know, it's like my mechanics were off. I need to change something. It's like, okay, well, maybe you just like threw 50 too many throws two days ago. Or maybe you you were you didn't recover very good yesterday. Because Pulse does a really good job of measuring the stimulus, but we're still making assumptions about how well you're recovering, how well your how good your diet is, how good your uh your sleeping and your rest is. So performance, I think, is less linked to workload than it should be in a lot of people's intuition. Um, but arm health seems to be pretty related to, uh, workload in people's heads, which I think is why things like pitch smart, uh, at the youth level are become, or have become a thing where, you know, if you're a 
playing little league, you can only throw this many pitches and then you have to take this many days off uh, in the game. Yeah. I think that's, that's interesting to hear about like workload and velocity. We had a, uh, I think maybe the third episode of this series, we talked about recovery. Uh, and I, I just kind of, this triggered my brain because as you said, someone's like, it's my mechanics, it's this, like, it's obviously the pitching motion. I need to train my motion in order to get more. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, we had our head strength coach on at the, at the time during that episode. And she was like, it's just like, you're overflowing, like the buckets mm-hmm. overflowing. It's like, what you mm-hmm. might actually need is like better sleep. You need to just like take a day off. And so we definitely run into that uh, in softball pitching. It's like the way if someone wants more, the way to get to more is to do more always. I mean, very rarely do I have conversations where it's like you have to do less to gain more. Uh, That's a very uncomfortable topic just for parents, for for athletes. And honestly, like even in our like college game, I mean, like the amount sometimes I think this all the time, like, you know, you're allowed to practice six days a week, you know, once you're in season and games are rolling, but you, you have six days to practice. And then sometimes I'll be on the phone with a college coach and it's like their, their pitchers pitching just like six days a week, a pretty high intensity workout every day. Yeah. I'm like, just because that's the rule that you can, like, we, we got to collect something to see, like, there's no way this kid can sustain this. Like, if, and if she's your main pitcher and you want her to come out not only strong to start the season, but like last until May into June, like mm-hmm. this is insane. And that's kind of where I think we run into issues in the softball world. Like we have these expectations as if it's almost like we think our athletes are robots. Mm-hmm. It's like they can train an unlimited amount, unlimited intensity, and they're just going to be super strong all the time. And in reality, we're, we're kind of driving them into the ground. And so mm-hmm. um, interesting that you think there's a little bit of that that exists in the baseball world There's well. I think- I think there's a lot with, I mean, in our world, especially people come to driveline and they're very interested in gaining velo. That's something that like we have done a good job of, we can train velocity pretty well and we've gained a reputation about training velocity. So a lot of people think that we're just like a velocity lab or whatever, but like people come and the first thing that happens is if they, if they get, if they see some results, if they do the first, they do their arm ramp, And then the first velocity phase, they gain like four miles an hour. It's like, or not four probably, but like one or two miles an hour on their PR. It's like, I really like that. I really like seeing better performance. I really like seeing a higher number on the radar gun. So I'm just going to do more. Like this is the first time I've done this training. Why wouldn't I just do more plyos or do like another uh, plyo velo? Uh, day or do more in the weight room because I'm also gaining strength. It's like, you don't, when you're seeing these results, you're not thinking about how, if you overflow, like you were saying, you're going to have the negative, you're going to have the opposite effect, right? You're, you're not going to be able to continue just doing more and continue. Like it's not function. (laughs) The curve isn't work performance or work output. It's like our bodies don't work like that. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, you have to think to the whole system. So mm-hmm. if you drive one part of the system into overdrive, then like, yeah, it's just like going to throw everything out of whack. Um, I, I think that's, I think that's very interesting. And I think, um, I, I think a lot of times, like from a, you know, a lot of the education that we give, of course it's to parents and athletes, but it's, it's really to coaches. Like I think their main goal for us to break, there's a start to really like educating just like coaches as a whole as well. to understand like our traditional methods of like, if we put it in our athletes brains, that like, why aren't you performing? Why aren't you hitting your max velocity five days in a row? Mm -hmm. It's like, then they think like, that's what I need to be doing. So when they come and they're training individually, they're asking those questions. It's like, this is insane. Like you're not, you're a human being. You need some recovery. You need, you can't throw it max all the time. You're going to explode. Literally. I mean, your, your body cannot manage that. So, um, I just think that's a really interesting topic. And, and I think obviously to, to to think about that, that's, I think that's probably just human nature and like the athlete brain, right. Not a baseball softball concept, but like the athlete brain of just like, you know, like I have to get there and I'll do whatever it takes to get there, which is a beautiful thing, but we just need to obviously continue to educate on how that system really works. Redefine the Circle is brought to you by Rapsodo Softball. Whether it's at the plate or in the circle, Rapsodo delivers all the data needed to enhance your player's development and to give us a platform to become more informed and better coaches. Rapsodo pitching is absolutely critical when it comes to maximizing your pitchers. In addition to measuring velocity, pitchers and coaches get a detailed look at all of the ball metrics that influence break spin rate, spin direction, 
gyro degree, spin efficiency. Together, these metrics tell a story about a pitcher's data profile. And to grow that profile and ultimately maximize what that pitcher can become, understanding the metrics is a must. Rapsodo not only provides high-level feedback in the moment, but also creates back-end reports so coaches and athletes can visualize and fully understand the entire story and how it's progressing. Rapsodo is such a powerful tool. Instant data, relevant metrics, innovative visuals, and don't forget the in-app slow-mo video that allows pitchers to watch their pitching patterns right alongside the ball flight metrics they yield. Bottom line, Rapsodo is a must-have in the world of player development. See the data, feel the results with Rapsodo's softball technology. Like, do you think when some of your pitchers start using Pulse, do you think they're surprised? Like, do they usually start using Pulse and they're like, man, like I'm, does it really bring to light for them things that they did not realize about their training, whether it's like how well they're recovering or how much maybe they're actually throwing? Like, do you, is that sort of something that, or do you, or do you feel like the guys that are using it, they're kind of in the know to start? I think that there's two things. So I think they, they are surprised a lot of people, at least younger folks. I think the way that it works is younger. Uh, there, there's definitely some survivorship bias here, but younger athletes that don't have a like tried and true routine that has worked for them their entire career, it keeps progressing them to new levels. They don't have them. They can't just like feel the right thing to do. They don't have that feel that a veteran does who's a big leaguer or been in pro ball for a long time. And he knows his routine. He knows like how many throws that he's supposed to make to make him feel his best when he has to go into the game. So a lot of young athletes will throw, for example, it's like a bullpen day. We see it less in the gym because our, our program is very structured. Like we give specific like sets and reps. Um, but if you were to go like in pro ball or out on the field, if you're coaching a college team and you have an athlete and it's a bull, it's a side pen day and you can, they measure or they wear pulse the whole time. They sync their data and the coach and the athlete both see 250 throws. It's like, what? Like, this is a, like a middle of the week, like kind of volume thing. We weren't trying to blow it out today. And that's a, that's a ton of throws in one day. So it seems simple, but the wow moment coming from syncing this data and uploading it and being able to look at it is like, wow, that's a lot of throws. Like I don't even throw that many throws on game day when I start and throw four innings or whatever. So that's one of them. And then the other wow moment, and this takes like a week or two to sink in maybe, but you have these, especially with our program, um, with the recovery days and we have like a few different tiers. So we have a recovery day, which is the lowest intensity. We have hybrid B, which is in like kind of a middle intensity. And then we have a hybrid A, which is like approaching velocity and high max intent. And then we have our velocity days, which are obviously like, those are like intended to, you're supposed to blow it out. But we'll see that a lot of people will, they'll wear pulse for all those workouts. We'll take an average intensity by averaging like the torque or the arm speed um, that the sensor gives us. And then we'll see that the hybrid A or the velocity day is only like, you know, five units above your recovery day. Whereas your recovery day should probably be down here. Like there needs to be mm -hmm. some differentiation and in intensity for you to actually receive the recovery benefits. We're just trying to get the blood flowing, you know, and give your, give your body mm -hmm. some rest. But the other outside of the throw counts, the other wild moment is like, oh man, like maybe I don't regulate my intensity like I should. And here's a really easy visual just showing like a simple bar graph over seven days and seeing that all of the intensity and all the one day workloads are basically the same is a super easy way for it to sink in and be like, wow, I need to, I need to kind of like step back a little bit more on my recovery and hybrid B days. Yeah. I think that, that really resonated with me. It's basically like if all of your days are sitting in the same range, if you're throwing mm -hmm. at the same intensity all the time, it'll just be a flat line forever. Yeah. Which is like, yeah. if I had to summarize like softball pitching, that's what I would say. It's just like a constant. We want to know like, why is this kid stuck at, you know, we have this, this kind of challenge where as soon as our athletes are like post puberty and they've mm -hmm. plateaued in mm -hmm. their velocities or like my, you know, my daughter's been throwing 56 to 60, 62, whatever, then this range 
she was so great at this age. I'm like, yeah, well, she was going through puberty. And, you know, she was like growing, she's yeah. getting stronger. Like that's why velocity is going up. But then it plateaus and then it's stuck there. And it's like, mm-hmm. we, we're trying to find a new pigeon coach. We're trying to work on this. And there's, people just start throwing darts because we know that velocity is important. I mean, it's mm-hmm. important in, in both games. And so, uh, so everybody's chasing it, but everybody's like stuck. And I think that is such a great way. Like if we had something like polls to show you are just going to sit at that same intensity, but in order to have the spikes, you have to have the drop downs, right? You have to allow for intensity to drop down in order for it to come back up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're just going to sit and sit and sit. And like, I, I I just think that that again, really resonated because I would venture to say that it's just like the chronic issue going on in softball pitching. We just have to understand like we're in the softball community, we're like afraid of data. You know, it's like intimidating. Mm-hmm. We're in the like, we're a little intimidated by it phase as a community. And I think like something like that would just be really powerful for us to see. Um, for sure. Like some of these examples. For sure. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we were talking about it before, before we started recording as well. And it's just like, you can take it back to like basic physical training principles. So a lot of the people who fall into that trap probably have experience in the weight room. And they would tell you that they're not going to try to one rep max every day. They're not going to try to rep out, you know, find their three rep max or whatever and, and, and push themselves or run a marathon every day. Um, so I think like when you really start to break it down into things that we are more comfortable with that idea about, and then kind of transitioning that into throwing is just a physical training activity. Um, I think a lot of the same principles, principles exist and it just kind of makes sense if you think about it that way. Yeah. You also brought up something about like flexibility, basically like, uh, like the rigidity of a lot of guys Mm -hmm. on programs. Um, and I think like, first of all, if you don't have any data, forget like, you know, if it's like pulse data, ball flight data, like if you Mm -hmm. have no data, why would you be flexible? You know, like, I think that's one of the challenges that we have. It's just like, we do this, we do this, we do this because you have nothing, you have no information coming your way to say like, you have to make an adjustment. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's sort of like the first piece of why we always feel like, you know, data is critical. It's literally, uh, I think in softball, we run into people are starting to jump on the data train, if you will, mm. because it shows what that they're, you know, it kind of shows like, see like my validation. validation. It's like, yeah. no, that's not, you know, data is just like, you got to follow it, the story, whether it's showing that what you're the program is working for that athlete or it's not. And like, maybe it's not working for an athlete. It doesn't mean you're a horrible coach or you don't know how to program. It's just right. like that athlete's response is not on point. And, you know, for me personally, I know like some of my biggest, I was called like Dr. House moments have been of like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, mm-hmm. why is this athlete still stuck here? I'm just had to dig and dig and dig until we could find something that finally worked for her. And I think that that flexibility is really critical. So to now think of, you know, I'm thinking of that flexibility in, in programming just from like how literally in, in program design based on whether or not you're reaching your goals. But now pulse is like a whole nother level inside of that, right? Of like, based on, I expected to throw this, I wasn't supposed to throw on Saturday, but I did. And Mm -hmm. so now you should just go in on Monday and have the same normal Monday workout or routine. Um, so allowing flexibility, um, which is something that I feel like, you know, even, you know, here at S2, like we're not there yet as far as like, you know, uh, you know, if our athletes in front of our face, like if they're here in house, absolutely. We'll be like, you know, let's cut volume in half. Let's do this. But as far as like some of our remote athletes, you know, something like that pulse sensor is so critical because you can get information about that, those athletes from afar, right. Even if they're not there to physically tell you, which is, I can just solely imagine it's huge. Definitely. And I think this is like, there's a bunch of things came to mind, but this on your last like couple senses, I think it like breaks down kind of a wall. Even if you're working in person with somebody a lot, like when I played, when I was in high school, coach would be like, how's your arm feel? And be like, Oh, it's good. Or when my arm hurt, they would be like, how's your arm feel? I'd be like, Oh, it's a little sore, but it's a good sore. It's, it doesn't hurt. I'm like, like, there's a difference, right? <laughs> like we can tell <laughs> like, a difference. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. Right, it's like, yeah. it's not, it's not my ligament. It's not my elbow. It's just like a little bit of muscle soreness or whatever. It's like, I had no idea. It's just, I'm conditioned to expect, you know, myself to be ready and everything. And I think having a piece of data to be able to kind of dig a little bit deeper and be like, okay, you're like, e- even if it's just velocity or whatever, it's like, okay, velocity's down a little bit. Are you like, 
your arm, how's your average sleeping? Like, how's, is your, is your arm actually feeling okay? Like, is there anything you feel has changed or whatever? And if you have something objective, some data to kind of back up your conversation and kind of make it a little bit more comfortable to, to be critical. Um, I think it helps. I'm one of my coworkers, Anthony Brady, I'm sure you're familiar. He talks a lot about how being data driven is like truly data driven is, is tough because you have to be okay with recognizing that sometimes the data is going to say that you didn't do a good job and you're going to have to stand by that and use those. Like, like we talked about the validation, but the invalidation is probably even more valuable from the data perspective. It's like that, those those moments where your program is invalid are going to be the way the how you can improve it going forward and improve like another 5% of athletes careers um, that may have not um, succeeded in the program before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking about this concept of like in softball pitching, I feel like our training approaches, the way in which we think about just like, preparation, whether it's really full team, but pitching specifically is like, it's so almost like warrior mentality. And now listen, everyone knows like a pitcher needs to have like a warrior in their soul, but from a physicality, like a physical standpoint of training, it's always about like the beat down, like a, like a discipline element. If Mm -hmm. that makes sense, like this element of just like being tough. And in reality, I think the thing about data to me is that like we have to understand the body it's a science and mm-hmm. training is a science and the data is able to really just give us information about how mm-hmm. to like maximize those things. And so as I'm just kind of sitting about like, you know, thinking of this world as if we, we were able to really easily get this information from our pitchers to really show like we are on the wrong track with how we're training. I think really that's like, sitting at in my soul right now is for the shift that we have to make is like, it's not this toughness factor. Yes. Pitchers need to have a competitive spirit. Like no one is denying those things, but from a standpoint of training and hitting goals and measuring them and, and making sure that you're putting them in the right environments to achieve what they need to, it's a science-based approach. I mean, it it has to be right. Or you're going to overdo it. Yeah. Yeah. And without data, I just, there's no way to do those things. So I think, Mm -hmm. You know, just, I think, you know, the velocity culture in softball, I think that's a great summary of it's just like, we're all over the map because it's just more is more is more. If you want it en- enough, if you work hard enough, I always say, like, <laughs> yeah, when it's all about someone's, great, right? Gr- you're right. When someone says to me, the first thing they always say is like, she works so hard. I'm like, well, that's the minimum requirement. The yeah. minimum requirement is working hard. Like if you don't work hard, like this is not like my expectations that like everyone works hard. Everyone wants that, but it's like, you have to understand how to work like appropriately. You have to have flexibility. You have to be willing right. to see that like you're not meeting the mark or that that's mm-hmm. not and willing to make adjustments. Like, I think that's the piece um, that, you know, we really are missing in our softball culture. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of cliche, but working hard doesn't necessarily mean working more, you know, like working, working hard with the proper intent with, you know, focusing on the right things. That's working hard to me working more, you know, that that's just not the same. It's just not the same yep. thing. This is, this might feel like uh, it's not off topic in my brain, but it, this might feel a little off topic. Do you have much of a culture in baseball, particularly with like some of your younger athletes, maybe high school level where, you know, in their like dead of off season, people are, their coaches are on them about max velocity or is there an understanding in the baseball culture of like, there's a time and a place to be at max velocity. I think there's an understanding um, that there's a time and a place for the most part. I think the the industry, my perception of the industry is um, that we've a lot of people on the, the, I think the argument isn't that some people think you need to be at max intensity all the time. I think the argument is that some people think you should just take time off completely, which might be right for some people, but it's just not that simple is what we're saying. Like we kind of land in the middle where like the whole like sports specialization and like, don't focus on baseball alone too early because you need the, all, all the uh, athletic movements or whatever. It's like, 
you know, that might be just like a byproduct playing other sports just keeps you from overloading your arm all season. So I think w- the argument is more like you can train in the off season. Um, as long as you're like smart about it or whatever, you can work on new pitches or you can work in the, sh- in the weight room or whatever. Um, Versus like having to do a velocity phase for 10 months out of the year. And then you perform for two months out of the year and then you go right back into velocity phase. So I think the baseball um, industry has done a good job of making it clear. You don't have to like always be pushing at your max threshold. Um, Yeah. And honestly, yeah, I think we could step back in some ways, but yeah, I think um, versus what you're, what you're describing in the softball industry, I think we, we have like moved the, moved the, uh, moved the needle there. Yeah, like you you called something a velocity phase, mm-hmm. like a velocity yeah. phase. <laughs> yeah, you know, like basically, like you are saying that there is a time of the year where you're entering a velocity phase, and, and like from the softball culture, we're like, isn't that every you know, isn't that twelve <laughs> yeah. months of the year? Aren't we always in velocity? Phase? Honestly, what really like inspired me to talk about velocity and velocity culture? I just was like, I can't, I can't take this anymore. Like this is crazy. Our athletes our athletes are incredible. You know, like they are just like, they are grinding, they're flying across the country Mm -hmm. to come to this place where it's like the only place where they can get information and they're digging for things. And, um, and you know, they're just high schoolers, Mm -hmm. you know, like we, we're just these high school athletes who are, you know, like one step away from either being recruited or going to their next step. And, and it was an athlete who is committed to a power five school. Great, great pitcher. One of the best in the country. And she was like, you know, I'm just, my coach is like wondering what's been happening with my velocity. I had, she had just started training with us. And so it was January, right? So it's like, I mean, dead of off season and they had an indoor game. So we just, we play games all the time. Like there is no mm-hmm. downtime. So we play games all the time. <laughs> no so off-season. that's, there's no, there is no real off season, but it's, it actually is off season. And, um, and she's like, you know, I hit 68 once at a camp. I'm like, so, and I was like, well, what were you throwing, you know, in live when you were in your game? She's like 65. I'm mm-hmm. like, and he wanted to know basically like why my velocity has gone down. Yeah. I'm like that is such a complicated answer of just like there's so many things like i get that you threw 68 once ever Mm -hmm. right and so like maybe that's like generally what you can hit at your mac that doesn't mean you're just going to sit there all year round nor do Mm -hmm. we want you to right because like the more that you're striving for that the less likely you're ever going to hit that again it's like you're just this is crazy and so i thought she plays for one of the if not the best like travel program in the country she's one of the best pitchers in the country going power five next year it's like we have the wrong messages swirling around these athletes. Yeah. And here's a kid just like, tell me what I can do to make sure I, my next tournament, I throw 68. I'm like we got to redesign how you're thinking about this yeah, um, because this is a problem. Yeah, for sure. That seems a little bit, a little bit scary in, in some, some cases, but I think like we see it all the time, even with big leaguers going into the spring season, it's like, they're not throwing, if they throw 98, like some, some of them are th- are sitting 98 miles an hour in the game in the regular season. And, you know, we'll see somebody and they'll be throwing like 88 or 89 or 90 in a pen six weeks before the season or however many weeks before the season. And it's okay. It's okay that they're sitting that velocity because they're still on ramping. They're still getting ready for the season. There is an on ramp on ramping phase, especially for those who just completely take, you know, two months in the off season off. And even during the season, like, there's a term in, in baseball called midseason form and midseason form is like, you have your best stuff. You have your, your best velocity. I might, may have bastardized that, that definition a little bit, but like midseason, midseason form is just like, Oh, that guy's already in midseason form and it's spring training. It's like just the fact that we have that idea that midseason is when like they mm-hmm. should be performing their best or they should be performing how we have seen them in prior years, I think is a, is a good thing. Absolutely. I don't know how much college softball you watch or have been watching now that obviously it's televised a lot more. You should, if you don't, cause it's really incredible and exciting, but, yeah. <laughs> but I like, as the games are on, like it's February and there's like huge matchups on TV. And I mean, it's mm-hmm. like, you're watching the national championship in February and you know, just like the softball lover me, the spectator, I'm like, I'm glued to the screen. Like, this is incredible. But then in the back of my mind, I'm like, (laughs) I'm having a panic attack because I'm watching all of these pictures, essentially 
in softball, we've got like two pitchers, two to three per, you know, like that's the full staff. Yeah, I and know. The full staff, like that, those are the ones that contribute. Like, you know, yeah, I show five, you have six, but like two to three contribute. And mm-hmm. so I'm watching all these pitchers. They're going like, you know, these tight full seven innings, maybe sometimes extra innings against like other power five schools, just like really, really high levels of competition. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, we are going to ask this kid to sustain this level of performance Mm -hmm. all the way February, March, April, May into June. Like this is not fair to this kid. And so I was actually just watching, uh, you know, an interview with a college coach and she was, you know, like her pitcher did not do well. Uh, it's a kid that's been throwing. She's been throwing since February, like every single game, you know, and she was really kind of negative in the interview. Like she doesn't have this, she doesn't have this and have this. And I'm like, at some point we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Like yeah. how yeah. can we expect these athletes and these pitchers to just keep sustaining this level of performance? Like this is where it's like anti-science. It doesn't make any sense. They're not robots. They're not just like programmed to do the exact same thing. Like the body is going to wear down. So yeah, I think like, I'm just like want to climb to the top of this building and like scream from the rooftop. There's like, listen to the type of things that Kyle is saying. Like, you know, we, we, in softball, we're like, we deserve everything that baseball gets. Absolutely. But like, let's talk about these concepts of like, the way in which they're you guys are willing to like keep growing the game and see these elements of like expectations and 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 like the your culture allows you to maximize performance for your guys and in my mind our culture is a giant hurdle for our athletes for sure i think baseball does a good job of that. I think there's still a little bit, baseball's not perfect, uh, far from it. And, and there is still, I think some of that and people who have been, have gone a whole career and they have this one program that's worked for most people. It's like hard to convince them that that needs to be looked into because sometimes it just doesn't, sometimes it just works for these people, but it just doesn't work for, for every person. doesn't work for every situation. And there's just, there's just so much to, the human body and what we can handle and how to better prepare ourselves. And you can, I mean, it can be applied to, to literally anything. Like if, if, um, if I'm getting prepared for a long day at work on Thursday, like I probably shouldn't stay up until 4 AM on Tuesday night. Um, and, and like wearing myself out, it literally can be felt by every person, uh, and how they prepare for what they do on a daily basis. So I don't think it's any different from that. And it's just, you know, Figuring out how to how to more properly prepare yourself is uh, extremely important and takes a lot of intention. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Kyle, thank you. Uh, don't want to take too much of your time, any more of your time, but I really appreciate it. And I think just generally starting to have this conversation of like what's going on in baseball, what does workload mean, how are they measuring it, what are the types of things that like you know it's how is it helping to grow performance and the game generally. I mean, I think that it's, it's so clear to me and I think it's exciting because it shows us the future for softball. And so like, you know, the goal of, of this podcast is really just to like start getting people, I think, to question, like you got to mm. question the current things that we do. You've got to question the culture. And just because you did it when you were a pitcher and you were yeah. great, doesn't mean like, that's it. That's the way we all should teach and do it. Um, and so I think it, this, these discussions you know, on the baseball side, again, I know underhand, overhand throwing is a little apples to oranges, but the human body is the human body, as you said. And so I think it's important to understand seeing where you guys are and where you're continuing to push um, is shows us the direction that we just have to keep driving in. So um, thanks for your time today. Uh, everyone, listeners, viewers, thanks for tuning in again to Redefine the Circle. Um, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on.